I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. We're hard at work putting together a new batch of episodes for our third season, digging into my archive of decades-old audio cassettes to bring you never-before-heard interviews with the people who lived and breathed the fight for LGBTQ civil rights. Coming up in a couple of weeks is a new episode with trans icon Sylvia Rivera. But first, I'd like to reintroduce you to our very first episode, where we featured Sylvia's extraordinary voice for the first time. Sylvia happened to be at the Stonewall Inn on June 28, 1969, the first night of the big uprising. On this tape, you'll hear me call Sylvia Ray, which was one of the names she was going by at the time. Interview with Ray Rivera, Saturday, December 9th, 1989, at 4 p.m. Location is the home of Ray Rivera in Tarrytown, New York. Interviewer is Eric Marcus, tape one, side one. The Stonewall wasn't a bar for drag queens. Everybody keeps saying it was. Mm -hmm. So this is where I get into arguments with people. They say, oh, no, it's always a drag queen bar, and it was a black bar. No. Washington Square Bar Mm -hmm. was the drag queen bar. Okay, you could get into the Stonewall if they knew you. And there were only a certain amount of drag queens that were allowed into the Stonewall at that time. We had just come back in from, um, from Washington, my first lover and I. We were passing forged checks and whatnot, but we were making good money. And so, well, let's go to Stonewall. Let's do our thing. Let's go there, you know. Actually, it was the first time that I had even been to freaking Stonewall. I was in full drag. I was dressed, you know, very pleasantly. I was wearing a woman's suit. Bell bottoms were out there, and I had made this fabulous suit at home. And I was wearing that, and I had the hair out. Lots of makeup, lots of hair. <laughs> Were you drinking at the bar or just standing around? No, I I was drinking. The police came in. They came in to get their pay off, as usual. They would come in, padlock the freaking door. As soon as they left, the mafia was there, cut in the door. They had a new register. They had more money and they had more booze. This is what we learned to live with at that time. We had to live with it. We had to live with it until that day. I don't know if it was the customers or was the police. It just, everything clicked. Everybody just like, why the fuck are we doing all this for? The people at the bars, uh, especially at Stonewall, were involved in other movements and everybody just like, all right, we got to do our thing. We're going to go for it. And when they ushered us out, it was nice, you know, when they just very nicely put you out the door and then you're standing across the street and shut in the square park. And But why? But why? All of a sudden, you just feel this. Everybody's looking at each other. But why do we have to keep on constantly putting up with this? And the nickels the dimes, the pennies, and the quarters started flying. Why? Why why that? Why do people do that? The payoff. That That was the payoff. Oh, 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 oh. That was the payoff. It was to symbolize the payoff. Yep. You already got... Here's some more. And here's some more. To be there, you know, it's just like, oh, it's so beautiful. I just like, you know, it's like... Was it exciting? Oh, it was so exciting. It was like... Oh, we're doing it. We're doing it. We're we're fucking their nerves. The cops were, you know, they they just panicked. Inspector Pine really panicked. Mm-hmm. He really did. Mm-hmm. Plus, he had no backup. Mm-hmm. 
he did not expect any of the retaliation that the gay community gave him at that point. Do you think all this was in, in part because people were so angry for so long? People were very angry for so long. I mean, how long can you live in a closet? I was already out of my closet. When you're obvious back then, there was nothing to hold you back. It was always the effeminate male or the butch woman. That's what society always looked like. We all the ones that went out there and we didn't take no shit from, from them. We had nothing to lose. Actually, you know, at that, at that point in time, you know, I understand the ones that held their heads down low because they probably had very nice jobs and they had a family to go to. I was born to be an effeminate child. My grandmother used to come home and find me all dressed up. It's just like, I get my ass whipped. Of course, you know, well, we don't do this. You're one of the boys. I want you to be a, a mechanic. Uh -huh. I said, no, but I want to be a hairdresser. <laughs> I want to do this. <laughs> and I want to wear these clothes. And I was born July 2nd, 1951 at 2.30 in the morning, in a taxi cab, in the old Lincoln Hospital parking lot. The old queen couldn't wait. <laughs> she said, well, I'm ready to hit the streets. My grandmother used to always joke about that. I said, yeah, I said, you see why I'm always standing out on the street corner? <laughs> That's good. And then I was came out feet first. You did? Yes. Oh, so you landed on uh, mm, landed So on the I was ready. I always mention my grandmother because my, my mother died when I was three years mm -hmm. old and she raised me. Mm -hmm. So it's my grandmother that raised me until I left home. Right. So you left home at 10? Yeah. I left home about 10, 10 and a half. I was almost 11. You know, the only reason that I left home at such an early age was because my grandmother came home crying one day with the tears in her eyes and said, calling you a pato, which means faggot. Mm -hmm in the Spanish language. And it, it hurt her so bad because they were doing this to me and she knew where I was coming from. She even knew. I had that much respect for my grandmother. I, 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 didn't, I, didn't, want, I didn't want her to suffer. It wasn't my suffering. I was worrying about her suffering. How did you survive on the street? <laughs> you became a street walker. You stand down on the street and you make money. At that age? That, at that age, it was easy to make money. <laughs> I don't know how many times my grandmother had to come and bail me out of jail. She was there. She always came and bailed me out. She says, oh, that's my grandson. I have to take him out. What were you in jail for? Prostitution, you know, right. bullshit, laudering. Right. Nothing major, you know. If you walk down 42nd Street, it even looked like a faggot. You were going to jail. So you went to jail a few times? Oh, I went to jail a lot of times. The community is always embarrassed by drag queen. Why do you think? Why do I think? Yeah. No, it's not why I think I know. Okay, why do you know? Because straight society always looks Oh, well, a faggot always dresses in drag, or he's too effeminate. you got to be who you are. Mm -hmm. Passing is like saying a light-skinned black woman or black male passing for white. And I refuse to pass. You couldn't have passed? No, I couldn't have passed. Not in this lifetime? No, not in this lifetime. I just like being myself. Right. It's fun being so it's fun playing the game. You'll hear more from Sylvia in a couple of weeks about her life as a young teen hustling on 42nd Street in New York and about her efforts to create a safe space for even younger street kids who had no place to go. The Making Gay History podcast is a co-production of Pineapple Street Media. This episode was funded by the Arcus Foundation. Our upcoming third season has been made possible by the Ford Foundation. 
And if you like what you've heard, please subscribe to Making Gay History on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, NPR One, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find all of our episodes and photographs, transcripts, and links to additional information on our website at makinggayhistory.com. So long, until next time. 